All right, we are recording. We are live. Uh, audio and video is up. It's a day early, but happy Halloween, everybody. Um, uh, I, I mean, influence lines are scary, I know. Um, see, if I had any any foresight, I would have gotten, a, I don't know, like a Michael Myers mask for lecture, Dr. Mike Myers or something, but I, I, I didn't do that. Um, I figured the jack lanterns are, are festive enough. <laughs> um, quick, uh, uh, just quick housekeeping items. So I'm going to assign 7.3 today. Um, what we're going to do today is, you know, Monday we covered reactions for influence lines and Wednesday we covered influence lines for sheer and moment. And what I want to do today is I kind of didn't mention a particular topic on Monday and Wednesday. And I kind of did that on purpose because I want to ease you into the topic of influence lines. Uh, I want to talk about fixed supports. Um, how does an influence line change when you have a cantilever or you have a, a, a fixed support that has a vertical reaction and a moment reaction? Uh, it's not hard. And every theory that we've derived up until now still works. Um, but you have to re-examine that theory and you have to ask yourself, okay, what, um, you know, how, how does the application of that theory change when you're dealing with a, um, uh, uh, with a, a, a uh, fixed support? And then I want to show you influence lines for trusses. Um, I'm not going to make you do one, but I do want you to kind of understand how you would uh, generate them. Uh, and the long and short of it is there's no real shortcut with trusses. There are some observations that you can make that will make your life a little easier. But there's, I mean, there's no real trick to it. Uh, you just kind of have to use the brute force approach. Uh, but that'll uh, that'll become clear as we uh, as we progress. Okay, um, so let's. Let's go back to the Mueller-Breslau principle. I want to I want to read that in detail, um, and, and you know, I've, I've got this worded a, a particular way um, because how, how this uh, how this affects fixed supports uh, is really important. So um, let's go back to the statement of the Mueller-Breslau principle. The deflected shape of a structure represents the influence line uh, for a given effect if that effect is moved through a displacement. So you identify a response, remove from the structure the ability to resist that response, and then you move the structure through a deformation. Okay. So um, I want to walk you through how that uh, affects a fixed support. Okay. And I'm going to stop the share real quick because I kind of want to use the board here for this. So let's say we have, I'm going to make up a beam. Okay. Um, let's say we have a beam that has a fixed support. Um, let's say that it has a roller right here, and let's say that it has an internal hinge right here, okay? Now, let's, uh, let's just sort of recap what's going on here. So, we have a vertical reaction here, um, we have a vertical reaction here, and we have a moment reaction right there. So, you know, let's just sort of keep that, that in mind, okay? Now, the reason I'm using this beam is because I want to sort of reuse my little prop that I had, had uh, made the other day. So, I want to walk through how to draw some influence lines for, for a beam like this. Okay, so let's say I'm drawing the influence line for this reaction here, the reaction over here on the right. I would remove from the structure the ability to resist that reaction. So maybe what I'll do is I'll draw like an identical beam right below it. And we'll say, you know, this is this upper one's the original beam. And then the beam below it is, you know, what happens when we remove the, the response. OK, so. All right. So let's say let's say we have this beam and let's say we're drawing an influence line for this reaction. OK. So we remove from the structure the ability to resist that reaction, and then we move that through unit displacement. Okay, so what does that look like? So imagine here's the beam, okay, and I've got my hinge here, I've got a fixed support here, and there's no roller here. So if I take this point and I move it through a displacement, it just does that, right? So the influence line for this reaction here would sort of look like this. Like here's your line, it would sort of go flat, and it would go up and it would go down and that would be one okay 
And I think that's pretty easy, right? That should be pretty straightforward. That's going to be the influence line for this reaction. Remove from the structure the ability to resist that reaction. Pick it up one. What does the structure look like when it's displaced? That's the influence line for the best support reaction. So is everybody good with that? Any any questions on that? That should be pretty simple, at least with, with what we've done up until now. I'm not seeing any, so so I think we're good there. Okay. Now let's let's test out some other uh, influence lines. Okay. Now, here, here's where I really want you to pay attention. Okay. So the influence line for the vertical reaction here is up like that. So does that mean that the influence line for the for this vertical reaction is that? Is that the influence line for this vertical reaction? The answer is no. No, it is not. Okay. This is wrong. This is not the influence line for this reaction. So maybe I should put some letters here. We'll call this support A, support B. Let's see if we can reason through what the influence line for the vertical reaction A is. Okay. So here's the thing. All right. And th this is what you got to sort of pay attention to. We are removing from the structure the ability to resist the vertical reaction, okay? So what you have to do is you have to sort of imagine a support that can freely move up and down. But I'm removing the vertical reaction, but I'm not removing the moment reaction, okay? So I have to ask myself how, look, here's my beam, right? I've got my little hinge here. Here's my beam. How do I lift this beam lift this point in such a fashion where I lift it, but I don't rotate it, right? Because the moment reaction is still there. How do I lift this beam but not rotate it? I do that. See what I'm saying? Instead of this, it's that. Because by lifting it like that, I've lifted it, but this is still flat. I haven't rotated it. So the influence line for this vertical reaction would I'd lift it up one, it would stay flat, the hinge would change the direction. This would be the influence line for the vertical reaction at A. Does that make sense? I wanna, I wanna walk through that for a second, see if anybody has any questions on that. That's really important. Okay, let's look. wasn't expecting that one. It was it was a surprise. Yeah, don't worry. We're gonna have a, a full blown example on that on this here in a second. Um, would it still do that if it was a pin support? No, it wouldn't. Okay, if you had a pin support here, then that's that's the whole point. A pin support allows rotation, so I can take a pin support and, and rotate it. Okay. But that, that's the whole point. The pin support can rotate, the fixed support can't. The fixed support has to remain at a constant slope. And the height at the hinge, yeah, this is one. So this is one and this is one. Uh, oh, oh, uh, so you're saying it be, yes, that's exactly, yes. Okay, I see what you're saying. So if this was a pin instead of a hinge, the, yes, you are correct. Um, in fact, and I've kind of glossed over this a little bit, but when we're drawing influence lines, we're kind of treating uh, vert, or we're kind of treating pin supports and roller supports somewhat identically. And here's the reason why: the whole premise of influence lines is really all about vertical loads. We're really only talking about moving a vertical load this way, you know, so it's only loads applied up and down. So if you're only dealing with loads that are applied up and down, then if you have a roller support versus a hinge support, or a roller support versus a pin support, what's the difference between the roller support and the pin support? Well, really not much because a pin support has a horizontal reaction, but there are no horizontal loads. So all of the, the horizontal reactions on your pin supports would just be zero. So a roller support has a vertical reaction, a pin support would have a vertical reaction, a zero horizontal reaction, really no different. So whether this was a pin or a roller, you'd get the, the same thing. Does that make sense? 
That's a good question. That was a really good question. Any other questions? Now, if we're doing now here, let me show you one thing real quick, okay? Um, just to sort of complete the picture here. And this might tie into what you, you were talking about. Okay, so just just so we're being complete here, okay. Here's the beam. This is the beam. Okay, what if we wanted to draw an influence line for the moment reaction at A? How would we draw an influence line for the moment reaction at A? Well, what we have to do is we have to remove from the structure the ability to resist this moment reaction. So basically what we would be doing is taking the beam and turning it into you know, a pin support, right? Because that pin support would have a vertical reaction, but then it would have no moment reaction. And then we'd have to take that and move it through a unit rotation. So if I have this beam and I take this end and rotate it, what does it look like? It does that. So the influence line for the moment reaction at A would look like this. That'd be the influence line for the moment reaction. Now that height wouldn't be one, this slope would be one. And so you would use that slope to figure out what this height is. And don't worry, we got a full fun example on that uh, here in a second. But, but the, the big point I really want to get across, and this is, you know, I've, I've been, uh, you, know, you know, where I've taught this a number of times, this is sort of my, my observation, is that when you're dealing with a fixed support, um, this is really what I'm after, okay? So you have a fixed support that has a vertical reaction, and it has a moment reaction when you're doing the vertical reaction what you have here in this box is incorrect you know if you were to lift it and it kind of looks like that that would be wrong because that would be translating it and rotating it that's not correct if you have a fixed support and uh connection is a bit shaky for me at the moment is everybody is anybody else having an issue with uh the the is it cutting in and out Okay, I'll, um, okay, let me, uh, I'll, I'll keep on trucking, and if you all have, if, if it starts to get systemic, let me know, and we can, we can sort of figure something out. Um, so, uh, again, when you do that translation, remember that, you, you know, if you're doing a vertical reaction, you're translating, but you're not rotating. Uh, and what I want to do is I want to go through a, sort of a full-blown example on drawing influence lines for just a simple cantilever beam. But we're going to do them all. We're not going to do just the uh, vertical reactions and the moment reactions, but we're also going to do shear and moment at a given point. And I think you'll be able to connect not just the, the mechanics of what it looks like to deform the beam, but I think you'll also be able to tie this to just what the reaction should be, like the actual statics of the situation, because it all sort of connects. So let me stop the share here. Uh, just so everybody's aware, I'll say this in advance. I left my smart pen at home, so if we uh, if we have any issues there, just just bear with me. I'm using a, a an updated version of OneNote, and I'm hoping that sort of helps me out with that. Okay, so here's the beam. Um, uh, I'm going to first off, let's draw the. Oh goodness, yeah, this is, I knew this was going to happen. All right, so let's um, draw the guidelines. Um, you know what? I, I actually, yeah, we'll, we'll leave them there. Okay. Now let's draw the you know, this line here. We'll say we'll start off with the influence line for a y. Okay. So again, yeah, I'm not using my smart pen, so I know the handwriting looks horrible. Um, okay. So. What are we doing for the influence line for AY? Again, we remove from the structure the ability to resist that vertical translation or that vertical uh, uh, support, but we do not rotate it, okay? So how do you take this beam and lift up point A, lift it up a single unit, but don't rotate it? How do you do that? You pick up the whole beam and lift it up one. That's the influence line for the reaction at A, okay? 
this is one this is one okay now let's see if we can tie this to you know like like a real life scenario okay so So here, here's a cantilevered beam, okay? Now, let, let me ask you a question, okay? Here's a beam. I'm going to take a load. Better than that. I'm going to take a load here. Let's call it a unit load. I'm going to put it on this cantilevered beam. Let me ask you a question. What's the reaction? have a reaction here and a reaction here what is the reaction today I mean, I'm asking one it's it's one but here here's the question that one of the things I did not tell you just now is where the load was on the beam I said the loads on the beam but I didn't say where but now let's at let's follow that up does it really matter where it is but does it really matter if i took the load and i put it here or put it here or put it anywhere along the beam no matter where that load is on the beam i'm going to get a vertical reaction of one every time okay so again i propose that whenever you have a cantilever beam like this what's the influence line for the reaction eight? it's just one just a solid one across the board So that's the influence line for the reaction today. Does that make sense? Anybody have any yeah. questions on that? Good deal. Okay. Now let's draw the influence line for the moment reaction at A. Okay. Now, in order to draw the influence line for a moment reaction, okay, so one of the things I'll, I'll, I'll have to you know, mentioned right off the bat is, you know, we haven't really talked about sign convention in regards to reactions. Like, because if we're drawing an influence line for a vertical reaction, we just say up is positive and down is negative. But for moment reactions, we kind of actually have to say something. We have to actually, you know, pick a direction. So, you know, let's say here's our, our reaction right there. That's the, the moment reaction. So, what direction is that what uh counterclockwise okay so when i draw my influence line for the reaction for the moment reaction i kind of have to just pick a sign convention um, i didn't have to do that with vertical reactions because again i just you know upward reactions are positive but here i kind of have to pick one okay now what i'm going to do is i'm going to take this point and i'm going to rotate it i'm going to rotate it so that it has a slope of one Okay, it's not going to translate. It's just going to rotate. So that means the if if I take this point right here and rotate it, my influence line is probably going to look something like that. Now this slope, hold on. Man, this pen is horrible. Uh, that slope is going to be one. The big question is, what is the value right there? Okay, well, think of this. If that line has a slope of one and the beam is 20 foot long, what's the value at the end? Pretty simple. 20. 20. 20. There you go. That's exactly right. So what is the influence line for the moment reaction at A look like? 20 right there. That's it. That's the influence line for the moment at A. Pretty straightforward. Any question this? And I mean, you can tie this also to the real life example up here, right? If I have a cantilevered beam, I put a unit load right there and the beam is 20 foot long like what's the moment reaction it's 1 times 20 it's 20 right so that's your moment reaction
That simple. All right, any questions? Hold on. I don't know what's going on there. Let me see if I can select that. What about shear? Oh, I'm glad you asked that. That's what we're doing now. All right, let's talk about the influence line for shear, okay? And because this pen is really just not being a fan of me today, I'm just going to, um, I'm gonna draw a really big beam. Okay, so let's, let's look at the influence line for shear. Okay, so here's the beam and we're gonna draw an influence line for that point right there, okay? So let's see what that influence line would look like. Okay, so let's let's reason through this. Let's talk about the shear influence line. So let's go back to our concept of the, the Mueller-Breslau principle for shear, okay? What did we know? What do we have to, to do here? So maybe what I'll do is I'll write, you know, uh, uh, rules. What are our rules, okay? The total translation has to be one, right? So remember on some of our previous problems, right? If I go back to some of the ones where I had a neater pen, like if you look at, um, let's say this one right here, okay? When we did the influence line for shear at this support, you know, what did we get? We had, you know, 0.7 down here, we had or 0.3 up here, that total jump was one, okay? Well, the same thing's gotta be true here. We gotta make a total jump of one, okay? So that's true, the total jump has to be one, okay? What else? Um, we also know about the slopes, right? The slope on either side of the, the, the shear influence line has to be identical. So same, Oh, come on. Same slopes, okay? So let, let's think about that. How do we draw this influence line so that there's a total jump of one, but the same slopes? What do we do? Do we like do something like this? Do we you know, do something like that? What would be, is this correct or not? And, and tell me why. Anyway, let, let me put it like this. This is wrong. Tell me why it's wrong. Why is this influence line incorrect? Somebody in chat. I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with there. Something's up there. I drew this influence line. That influence line is wrong. Why is it wrong? It has something to do with there. If it's fixed, it wouldn't be zero. Well, what do you mean it wouldn't be? Here's what I'm getting at. This influence line is wrong because all oh, this pen. Because you rotated that point, okay? This influence line is wrong, okay? Let me show you what, what you got to do. So Mr. Bauer's ba basically kind of saying this, the, the, the same thing. He, he's, he's on the right track. What we have to do is we have to translate this a value of one and it has to be the same slope. But the other kicker is that the, the support on the left can't translate or rotate. 
So what does the shear influence line look like? It looks like that. That is the influence line for the shear at B. Does that make sense? Because that's the only way that I can cause a total jump of one, but keep the same slope. Because here, here's what's going on on the other side. See, here, here's the cantilevered beam, right? Okay, here's the beam. Let me see if I can sort of view in a little bit. Okay. I've got to do a shear release. Remember, I've got a fixed support right here. Maybe I'll hold it this way because the fixed support was on this side. Okay, if I take this side of the beam and pick it up, remember, I've got a fixed support right there. So that's going to bend the beam, right? So if I, if I go here, I can't pick up or move, you know, this, this side of the beam. I can't pick this up because this support here on the left, that's still fixed. I have to translate that so that it has the same slope and there's a total jump of one. The only way to do that is to pick that entire left side uh, and move it up. That's the influence line for the shear at B. If I wanted to draw the influence line for the moment at B, What does the influence like the moment it look like? We'll just insert a hinge and rotate it, okay? So what does that look like? Well, you could draw that any way you want. Typically what I'll do is sort of draw it like this because, um, you know, that's, that's where your hinge is. Um, why am I drawing it downward? Why am I drawing it negative? Because when you're drawing the influence line for you know, the moment at B, you're drawing the influence line for internal moment. And so if I think about internal moment, this is a cantilevered beam. If I load that beam, the beam's going to frowny face. It's going to be negative bending. So that's why I draw it downwards. Now, if you remember, this, uh, this dimension is 10 feet. This dimension is 10 feet. And so what's the value? Well, if the line has to have a slope of one, it's negative 10. And that's the influence line for the internal shear and the internal moment uh, at that cantilever. So just to recap, we've got the vertical reaction, we've got the moment reaction, we've got the internal shear, and we've got the internal moment all taken care of. Any questions? I want to show you what's going on with trusses real quick. Um, I can't see your screen. You can't see the screen? Can it, it, can, is everybody else having a problem with that? I, like, I have the notebook up now. Well, let me restart. What about, is it, I want to say, is this, okay. That might be just, just on, on you. Um, let me go to the, the slides. But again, if y'all have any questions, let me know. All right, so. Is everybody like um, is everybody experiencing a bit of lag or is it just like a couple? Okay. You all all, all are experiencing lag. Okay. Um, what I'll do so I'm gonna obviously. 
Well, it's also probably being a bit loaded down more than it normally. A lot of downloads and uploads with uh, with uh, you know, people teaching online with the coronavirus. Um, let me, I'll tell you what, I'm going to just try and get through or muscle through this trusses one, but I'll sort of check the recording afterwards. And if there's anything I need to clarify, I'll, maybe I'll post a, like a short little like accompanying video like I did last time because we ran out of time. Uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about trusses. I'll go ahead and tell you that example I already did in advance, so I don't have to worry about my my crappy pen today. Um, let's talk about the influence line uh, method for trusses. And the thing is, um, let's talk about the theory and let's talk about application. So, you know, the idea of the Mueller-Breslau principle works in concept, right? You take a structure, you uh, remove from the structure the ability to resist that response, and then you move the structure through a unit displacement. Okay, that that is, you know, that works in concept. But try and do that to a trust. Like, okay, so we're going to do an example on this. So let's say you're going to draw the influence line for member AB. What you would have to do is you'd have to remove member AB from the structure, take the structure, move it through a displacement, right? And so what does that even mean? It sort of means taking member AB and like making it longer. Like you'd have to take member uh, AB, increase its length, and then you'd have to draw what the deflected shape of the truss looks like. I don't know about you, but I can't do that in my head. If you can, hey, great, but most most can't, uh, especially trusses get more and more complicated. And so the only way really to effectively draw influence lines for axial forces is through brute force. Um, and what I mean by that is what was our basic definition of an influence line, right? We take a, a load, we move it across the structure, and then we record the response and then we plot that response and that's the influence line. And so we kind of have to do that for trusses. Now we can still use the Mueller-Breslau principle for the reaction, like that's fine. But for the internal truss members, we kind of have to just grunt our way through. Now, the one sort of question that you kind of have to ask with a truss is where do you apply the loads, right? You take a load and you move it across the structure but with a truss, what does that mean? Does that mean you put the load on the top of the truss or do you put the load on the bottom of the truss? And the best answer that I have for that is really the practical answer is where would the load go in real life? So for, for instance, I got I pulled these two images uh, off of Google and I've got two different trusses that, that are very, very similar in geometry. But the truss on the left, I would put the loads along the bottom of the truss, and the truss on the right, I would put the loads on the top of the truss. Why? Because that's where the load would go in real life. Like, that's where the road is. Remember, one of the, the fundamental reasons that we're learning influence lines is for bridges. So think of these structures as bridges and ask yourself, where would the cars go? You know, where would the vehicles go? That was never a problem with the problems we've done up until now with beams. There's only one member. It's just going to go on that member. But with a truss, you kind of have to ask that question. Does the load go on the top or the load go on the bottom? So on this example, you know, we, we look at the truss and we ask ourselves, if this truss was in real life, like where would people drive on it? And I don't think people would be driving on the top of that truss, but they would be driving along the bottom of it. Bottom of it. The, the lower uh, uh, joints, the joints A, B, C, D, and E, they would be where the road is. So that's, that's how this would work. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to draw the influence lines for, I, I just picked three random members, member A, B, member C, D, and member C, H. And so because this is a truss, it, it, ultimately it's just, you know, a lot of work. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to say, okay, I'm going to put the load right there. And then I'm going to record, I'm going to do the full truss analysis, solve the truss, and then I'm going to take the load and I'm going to put it here and I'm going to solve the truss. So, so ultimately, you're going to have three different truss analyses. You're going to have a truss analysis with the load there, do the truss analysis. Then you're going to have a truss analysis with the load right here, do the whole truss analysis. Then put the load here, do the truss analysis. Now, um, one thing I'll point out is, you know, this truss is symmetric. So, you know, if you put the load, let's say, at joint B and you perform your structural analysis, then just take those results and sort of mirror them. Just flip them about the, the main vertical uh, uh, axis.
axis of the truss, and then you'll get the same results for if the load was deep. So, um, so don't try and you know make more work uh, than there really is. But let me sort of show you how that th this works uh, in practice. So. Give me one second. All right, so I have here this truss. I, I like I said, this one kind of did a little bit in advance, but I'll kind of walk you through it. So uh, first off, you know, uh, here's the truss, and and we're going to draw influence lines for a few different support reactions. But I gave you enough data so that if you wanted to sort of play around with it and see what other influence lines would look like, it's kind of a worthy exercise. So here's the influence lines for the support reactions. And to be clear, they're no different than the influence lines for uh, support reactions for any other you know, structure. I mean, if I take this truss and I remove from the structure the ability to resist, say, the roller support at E, and I pick that truss up one, I mean, it's going to look, you know, like you see right here. It's going to... Now, this is what it's going to look like. I, I don't think that's all that uh, that uh, uh, controversial. But in order to solve the um, the, the remainder of the uh, uh, values for the influence lines, you have to do the full-blown truss analysis. So what does that mean? It means putting the load at joint B and then solving the truss, right? So this image that you see here on the screen, this is what happens when you take the load and put it at joint B and solve the truss. So First thing to point out, if you put the load at joint B, you should be able to determine the reactions pretty easily. And where can you get the support reactions? You can get them from the influence line, right? If you have the load at joint B, you know, that reaction, you know, here's that reaction, here's that reaction, you know, just get them from the influence line. That, that's, you know, make it easier on yourself. Now, once you put the load at joint B and you get your reactions, then becomes the process of just solving the truss, right? So method of joints to solve out the truss. Now, there's a couple things you could do to make your life a little easier. For instance, uh, you can recognize zero force members uh, and see, you know, like joint B. If I got one down, I got to have one up. And you can do a lot of that to make your life easier, but you do kind of have to solve the, the, the truss. Then what do you do? You put the load at C solve the truss, uh, go through it step by step. Now, this is entirely symmetric. So I, if I was doing this problem, I would start at joint A. And once I got to the middle of the truss, I would just stop, you know, because everything else would be reflected. Uh, and then if I put the load at joint uh, D and solve the truss, well, look at the answer here. Those are just mirrored results from joint B, just taking it and flipping them about. Uh, if you want to draw the influence line for a particular member, just pick the member and, and follow what happens. So let's let, let's take member AB. Okay. So member AB had an axial force of positive one when the joint was at B. It had an axial force of positive two thirds when the uh, load was at C, and then it has a, a positive axial force of one third when the load was at joint D. So just tabulate that out, right? So Here's the, you know, load position, load, load position, load, load position, load. There's the influence line, right? Zero at the supports because the same uh, 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 philosophy applies. If the load is at the support, you're not going to get any re internal response in the structure, right? Because if the load's directly at the support, the structure's not seeing anything. So zero at the supports and then just follows the... Um, uh, uh, the values that, that you tabulate. So I'll show you a couple observations you can make. I'm gonna erase these. Um, let me show you a couple couple observations that you can make. All right, so here's some influence lines for you. These two influence lines that I picked, I have influence line for member AB and an influence line for member CD. AB and CD are both members on the bottom of the truss, okay? They're members on the bottom of the truss. And notice how every value on the influence line is positive, okay? That's because if this is, if these are members on the bottom of the truss and these are loaded vertically, so think about this like a beam. Like the top of the beam would experience compression, the bottom of the beam would experience tension. All the, the bottom cords of the truss are gonna be tensile members. So whenever you draw the influence line 
for a trust member and you're looking at the bottom chord, they're always positive, okay? So that's something that you, you really ought to uh, uh, keep in mind. What about uh, member CH? Member CH is a diagonal inside the truss. So we're talking about this member here. And we're talking about this internal diagonal. Whenever you draw the influence line for internal diagonals, they have a tendency to switch directions. Like they go from being tension members to go to being compression members. They're very akin to shear influence lines because the, in, the interstitials, the inner diagonal of a truss, if you ever use that term interstitial, I'm just talking about the inside uh, diagonals of a truss, those inside diagonals act a lot like the web in, a, in an I-beam and the web is what resists shear, right? So what does a shear influence line look like? You go uh, you know, from, from having you know, some values and then you have a jump, right? And so you can think of this diagonal as sort of having a jump when the load hops from one side of the diagonal to the other. So I'm curious. Let's see if, if everybody's paying attention. Just tell me if you could um, conceptualize in your head. If I were to ask you, what does the influence line for that member look like? What do you think it's going to look like? I mean, you could draw it with all the data that we have here. We could, we could draw that out. But what do you think it would look like? Is my Wi-Fi kicking off? Did anybody hear me that on that one? I can hear you, but uh, I'm just not sure myself. So here, here's my point, okay? This influence line right here is for this member, okay? And all the values are positive, okay? This influence line is this member and all the values are positive okay what i'm saying is that this member here is a compression member so whatever the influence line looks like it's going to be negative the influence line is going to go down because this member is going to experience compression See, here, here's what i'm talking about Okay, let's say that you're, let's say this beam was the truss. Okay, so this is the truss. If I take this beam and I load it vertically, what happens? Okay, so the top of the beam experiences compression. The bottom of the beam experiences tension. So whenever I draw an influence line for any of the members on the bottom of the truss, they're always going to be positive because no matter where I put the load, these bottom members experience tension. Likewise, it doesn't really matter where I put the load, whether I put the load here or here or here, it's always gonna make the beam, or in this case, the truss smile, right? So the top members are always going to be in compression. The influence line is always gonna be negative. So there, it's funny, there, there's a problem on uh, in, in uh, one of the, the FE reference uh, handbooks, it's like, here's a truss, what does the influence line look like? And so, you know, if you just think, okay, the, the compression members should always have negative influence lines, the tension members should always have positive influence lines, the inner diagonals will switch, you can do that problem in like a second. It's, it's pretty slick. Let me go back to the screen here. I'm not hearing much from, from the chat, so I really want to... Um, we really want to give everybody a second, see if they, they wrap their head around, not just this, but really the, the fixed support uh, as well. I want to see if there's any questions on that. Is there, it, how, how's everybody think, uh, feeling about that? Any questions? Anything that's um, confusing? I mean, we got time, so, so the floor is yours.
You go back to this one too. For the values other than one, how did you know to put them where they are? All right. Um, Can you point to a specific example? Because I'm I'm really not understanding the question. Like like point out a particular problem and let's look at it. Because there's a there's a conceptual issue there. I want I want to dig into, but but I I don't really know. I, I'm I'm having a hard time understanding that question. Like, if, is it a homework problem, an example problem in class? The cantilever or the truss? Truss. Okay. All right. Hold on. Let's go back to the truss. Okay. Are you talking about, okay, so let me just walk through the process again and let me see it, it, where, where it is. Okay. So what I'm doing is this. Okay. So here's the truss, right? So I'm moving that unit load across the truss. So theoretically, I would put it at five points. I'd put it at joint A, I'd put it at joint B, I'd put it at joint C, I'd put it at joint D, and I'd put it at joint E, okay? If I put it at joint A or I put it at joint E, the truss is not going to see any response at all. So if I put it at joint A, any of those members' forces are zero. If I put it at joint E, any of those uh, forces in those members are going to be zero, any, any of the internal forces, okay? So that means I really have three analyses I have to do. I have to put the load at joint B and solve the truss. I have the load at joint C, solve the truss. I have to put the load at joint D, solve the truss. What you see here, this, this image, this is after I put the load at a joint and then solved the whole truss. Going back to method of joints, method of sections. This is me, like, let's take, let's take this one right here. Okay, let's take this one. Okay, that's me putting the load at joint B and solving every truss. So when it says member AF, like when it says negative five force, this is that member is experiencing five force and compression after I've done a method of joints analysis. And I do a method of joints analysis for every member in the truss. And then I repeat it. I do it for joint C. And then I repeat it. I do it for joint D. I solve the entire truss. When, when the load is on each one of those joints. What I do here in this table is I just collect those like terms, uh, you know, say, okay, when the load's at B, what was the load in this member? When the load's at C, what's the load in this member? When the load's at D, what's the load in this member? I'm just getting those values from these, these solutions and, and plotting it. Now, I want to make sure I'm answering your question, though. Did I, did I, did I cover it or is there something else that, that, that I'm missing here? Turn that off. If you need to turn your mic on, that might help because I'm... Is my mic working? Is your mic's working? What I mean is, when plotting the influence lines for the members, how far away? Oh, I, all I'm doing is I'm just I'm plotting them under the joints, right? So this uh, so this one is under joint B. This two thirds is under joint C. This word is under joint D. And I'm putting them under the joints because 
those were the responses when the loads were, were, were at those joints. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm glad you're, yeah. No, that, that's, 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 that's a fair question. I'm going to erase some of this to clean this up a bit. I am definitely going to remember my pen during the next class. I know that some other professors here have a surface. I have class at one. I might ask to borrow their pen. <laughs> Any other quick questions before we call it? No, no worries. I mean, if, if, it, if it meant I needed to go through the, the example again, I'm sure there's other folks. This is a this is a new topic, and I and I, I definitely understand that. It's one that you got our head around. Um, it's 10:51, and so we're we're definitely probably running out of time. So I'm going to go ahead and call it. Um, if anybody has any questions or whatnot, uh, let me know. Uh, with that, everybody stay safe, stay healthy, happy Halloween, and we'll see you uh, see you next week.